the topic of our research paper was the Sasanian coinage of Shahpur II, classification and possible circulation routes in Indo-Sasanian commerce. Now, before starting with the paper, I'd like to brief you all about the aims and objectives and the reason that we chose this topic and Sasanian coinage. The aim and objectives of this paper were to form a typological classification of Shahpur's two coins and use the same to trace possible circulation routes of these coins in Indian Ocean trade. This classification has also been used to understand Indo-Sasanian engagement. As a matter of fact, we already know that many Indian coins were stylistically derived or similar to Sasanian coinage. The similarity was to an extent that we have an entirely different category altogether of Indo-Sasanian coinage. This was one of the main reasons for choosing Sasanian coinage as the topic for our paper. Another reason was to understand the role of Indian Ocean trade in terms of commerce at that time. So now moving along the topic, we'll be starting with an introduction to Sasanian Empire. Sasanian Empire was the longest ruling as well as the last Persian Empire known to exist. Established by Adashya, the Persian Empire came to an end upon the arrival of Islam, when most of its cities were absorbed by Islamic Caliphate. This empire under Shahpur II saw a shift of power from the courtiers to the king and many Arab invasions taking place in the territories of the empire. At its greatest extent, it covered entire areas of Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and parts of Syria, Uzbekistan, and so on, which can be seen from the diagram given on the next slide. So as you can see to the left, we have Sasanian Empire at its greatest extent. And on the right side, we have the extent of Sasanian Empire under Shahpur II. Now I'd like the Tarak to proceed further with the typological classification that we have. Oh, hello everyone. So um, now we are basically uh, uh, looking at specimens of uh, coins issued by Shapur the second. And uh, we had around 10 coins issued by him that uh, we studied from the British Museum. And we arrived at basically three types into which we might classify the coins. Now, why did we classify these coins of Shapur the second? One is obviously because uh, issues of identification and so that there is no faulty identification of these coins. And secondly, because as we will see, the coins of Shapur the second will form the very material basis for understanding the role that these coins were playing and the way they were being circulated in the Indian Ocean trade and Indo-Sasanian cultural and economic exchange around that Indo-Ocean trade route. So um, there are three basic types of coins that we have identified. The first one is one where you have the bust of the king on the obverse, but on the reverse you have this motif of two attendant figures with a fire altar in between them. So this fire altar clearly shows fire uh, on the standing altar piece. The second type of one where you have again the bust of the king on the obverse. On the reverse, you have a slight change. So you have the two attendant figures uh, and you have the altar in between but there seems to be a human head in place of the fire, which is, a, which is another type of the coin. And the third type of the coin is one where you have the king's bust on the obverse and on the reverse, you have the fire altar. So you have the fire on the standing altar in middle, but on either side of it, you don't have human standing attendant figures. You have something like incense stands. Um, which are shown in a uh, in a standing motif. So these are not those usual attendant figures that you see. These are the three basic types of coins, and these are coins which are both made of gold and silver. So uh, these are the three basic types of coins that we identified. 
and remember that there are minor variations in between so the king is generally facing the right but sometimes he is shown with a well formed beard sometimes he is shown at a younger stage and he is a, a sort of clean shaved figure sometimes the beard is not very well formed but rudimentary and uh, they are also stylistically different um now we are using these coins and seeing what we can understand and what we can uh, possibly infer about how these coins were being circulated uh, along the indian ocean now the rule of shafur the second is a phase which is characterized by a vibrant trade link um, with the persian gulf and the indian ocean uh, this is a period when the sassanids had gained complete control over the persian gulf and the important centers of trade and exchange were under the control of the sassanids so there are these important port cities like siraf and um, other places which are coming under the control and these are becoming vibrant uh, urban centers these are becoming important centers of trade and exchange uh, this is a period when you see a persecution of christians happening within first or which is the heartland of the persian sasanian empire a ripple effect of that persecution of christians is that a large number of christian merchants and missionaries are moving from the persian gulf and persia region into the malabar on the western coast of india and over large parts of kerala goa the coast of malabar and uh, even to the uh, even in gujarat and other parts along the western and southwestern coast these people are establishing their settlements so they are both merchants and missionaries and this is what then creates the so called islands of commerce along the western coast of the subcontinent so this is a process that happens from around the second third century ce and continues over a fairly long period of time for almost 10 or uh, 13 centuries into the medieval period and this is a period when you see a large number of these basically pehlavi speaking christian merchants from persia coming into these marts in kerala so you have these uh, traders guilds here the uh, traders guilds which are uh, here in kerala and uh, konkan and mahabalipuram and even down in sri lanka and the local kings are basically patronizing these merchants now when we see the coins um it is as we already noted there are both gold and silver coins um but it is probably um true that the gold coins were the high value coins so they were probably of a more commemorative value than uh, being really in circulation so um, according to many authors the silver coins were the ones which were more commonly minted and which were the more commonly circulated so the sources of silver there were many important sources of silver within the uh, sasanian realm but one is this panjshir in modern afghanistan which was a very important source of high quality silver so almost 85% pure silver was being minted and coins were being minted from this center and many other subsidiary centers all across uh, the persian empire and we can assume then that these are the silver drachmas which would be in wider circulation and these would have then reached the south asian coast now why were these coins being used and what was the exchange that was happening so as we can see the world famous malabar spices malabar pepper black pepper spices these are the most important commodities that are in high demand and um, basically there are farmers in the hinterland who have a good patch up network with these merchant communities settled along the coast and they are getting the supply of these commodities through that network of exchange whereby these uh, agriculturalists are also being converted to christianity in large numbers this is not a uh, conquest this is um, interaction and conversion uh, through that sort of an economic exchange so it's a give and take relationship and it's a, a sort of um, 
materialistic relationship that develops between these two communities from these local communities these produce is then being carried into the um, into the persian gulf and there is also this jewelry from india which is in high demand among the sasanians in a later period another important object is this red polished ware which you see um, a lot coming from a later period from the 5th century ce but um, uh, a recent paper by jason hawks who is an early medieval archaeologist has basically shown evidence of this kind of red polished ware coming from somewhat earlier levels in places in gujarat so in places like somnath and nagara we do find references we do find evidence of these red polished ware which is a sort of um luxury ware as well as a common type of pottery which was being imported as a by product so these are the common items of exchange as i have already said siraf ardashir riu these are the important mercantile hubs also uh, an important uh, center of exchange or an important center of exchange in terms of goods is sindh so in sindh it's a kind of a transit area where you have this huge um, port settlement um which is called bandhor and this is an important area where excavations are being carried out and we come across this image of a flourishing mercantile hub which was there from the sasanian times so this was an important outpost of the sasanian empire sindh so far as their interactions with south asia was concerned so uh, these are the important nodes of exchange and the so called islands of commerce and these are the routes along which the coins would have circulated possibly so this is a picture of bandhor and these are the different archaeological layers that we have come across at bandhor and if you see there are settlements uh, of a hierarchical nature but what is most important is the mercantile hub that we come across so there is also some kind of a local mosque uh, at this site showing that people were congregating and settling here for some time before sailing off now so far as indo sasanian coins are concerned we have very few uh, material evidences or remains that we could work with one of these is a not properly provenanced specimen from the princeton university collection and this is the uh, picture of the one on the upper right hand corner this is a coin from the time of shapur the um, second and if you see it carefully uh, the words the word shri is basically mentioned in brahmi letters on the obverse side of the coin beside the bust of the king and this is probably showing you the kind of by scriptural coins that were uh, being issued as indo sasanian relations of exchange and trade were becoming more and more vibrant and these are the types of coins that were in circulation uh, because uh, the audiences would have been people from both south asia as well as persia so not only you have persian speaking people coming into the subcontinent but you also have local dynasties and local kings like the king of malabar or the kings in um, the upper northwestern and western parts of the subcontinent who are also interacting here so these kinds of coins are then uh, commemorating that indo sasanian relations and those cultural exchange so uh, now we will move on to the conclusions what are the main conclusions that we could draw from this paper one is that when we look at the shapur the second coins there are three types of coins that we identified the one where you have the fire altar motif with two attendant figures one where you don't have the fire altar with the fire but you have the human head in between and the other where you don't have those attendant figures but you have these two incense sticks uh, stands and these are very common motifs that you also find in coins of ardashir from a previous period later coins of khusro and other rulers also show this these motifs so these are common in um, all the sasanian coins that you can study secondly silver is the most commonly used uh, medium for making coins in a wide circulation 
gold coins would be in a limited supply and therefore we can assume that uh, for the trade and exchange in luxury commodities spices jewelry pottery uh, this kind of silver coins were the medium of exchange and they were probably used here rather than the gold coins and thirdly we have looked at the major maritime trade hubs malabar coast gujarat goa mahabalipuram sri lanka and these are the sites where probably some of these coins would have been deposited and later they might also have been circulated elsewhere now um a major um, disadvantage or a major uh, limitation is that we do not still have a lot of coins to work with uh, so that we could uh, work out the entire circulation pattern of these coins and probably that will open up uh, the research into reconstructing the complete circulation patterns of these coins so uh, this is um, the study that we had conducted and uh, thank you everyone for uh, being patient and listening to us uh here we have a select bibliography a short one for the um, kind of uh, references that we have used and we would share the complete bibliography if willing and uh, we will put it across